Hello, this is Dr. Anthony Mancini from Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. Welcome to this educational activity, which aims to provide a unique visual update on best practices in addressing the burden of atopic dermatitis in pediatric and adolescent patients. The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Improving the Care of Young Patients with Atopic Dermatitis, Recognizing the Differences Between Children, Adolescents, and Adults. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash YGP860. Downloadable infographics and additional resources are also available. Let's start off by looking at the burden of disease when it comes to atopic dermatitis and its diagnosis. Atopic dermatitis is a chronic paritic inflammatory skin disease with a frequently remitting and relapsing course and which has been reported to affect around 15 to 20 percent of children and 1 to 10 percent of adults worldwide. Atopic dermatitis commonly presents by five years of age and the highest incidence is occurring between about three to six months of age, but it can occur at any age. Nearly 60 percent of patients will develop atopic dermatitis in their first year and about 90 percent within the first five years. And it's important to remember that one-third of children with atopic derm may have moderate to severe disease. It's important to consider the impact of atopic dermatitis on quality of life. On the basis of these measures, atopic dermatitis ranks second only to cerebral palsy among chronic childhood disorders. In this glance of comments from parents posted at the National Eczema Association website, 91% said their child had trouble in school because of their atopic dermatitis. Over half said it's difficult to treat, especially during the school day. Half said their child they suspect is exposed to triggers at school, and about one out of three said their child had difficulty concentrating in class because of their disease. This questionnaire also highlighted the impact on the entire family. 57% said that the parents felt guilty their child had atopic dermatitis, that sleep for the entire family was affected in over half, and 46% said that the medications and various therapies really had an impact on the overall family budget. It's also important to realize the impact of atopic dermatitis on mental health. When the disease is more severe, and especially when it's more poorly controlled, it can be associated with a variety of psychosocial stressors and psychiatric comorbidities. And this is probably driven by multiple factors, including the marked itch, the sleep disruption, and the social embarrassment. We have to be hypervigilant for depression symptoms and suicidal ideation, and really be open to consideration of discussing these issues and referral to our colleagues in psychology or psychiatry, especially in those who have more severe disease. Pathophysiologically, atopic dermatitis is a heterogeneous disease triggered by multiple factors in a genetically susceptible individual. There are both gene-gene and gene-environment effects that are thought to explain the pathologic mechanisms, and these mechanisms really boil down to epidermal barrier abnormalities and skin inflammation that is driven by T-cells. The strongest known genetic risk factor is having mutations in a gene that encodes for the protein filaggrin. This is an important epidermal protein to the barrier because its breakdown products actually bind water and have been referred to as natural moisturizing factor. Dysbiosis of the skin microbiota can also have a role in atopic dermatitis, and as we'll see, many of these patients are colonized with Staphylococcus aureus and often have secondary superinfection with a variety of organisms. Now, the cartoon in this graphic is quite complex, but really just highlights several of the different factors that lead to atopic dermatitis. You see healthy, normal skin on the left, and then changing over to diseased skin with atopic dermatitis, and becoming more chronic as you go towards the right side of the slide. So just focus on the epidermis. You can see that there's increased permeability. There's more space between those cells to demonstrate this. There are defects in the epidermal barrier, especially alterations in lipids, such as ceramides, which are a very important component of the epidermal barrier increase in pH, susceptibility to infections. And then as you go deeper into the dermis, you can see there's quite an inflammatory cascade. And I'll just point out some of the more relevant inflammatory cytokines. You see interleukin or IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, IL-31. These are all upregulated in patients with atopic dermatitis and drive this TH2-mediated inflammatory response. Interleukin-22 is also involved and is not demonstrated on this slide. This graphic shows phosphodiesterase 4 in purple. In healthy skin on the left panel, you can see that it's fairly low. Phosphodiesterase catalyzes the conversion of cyclic AMP to AMP, and having high levels of cyclic AMP is important because it inhibits transcription of inflammatory factors. If you look at the middle panel, patients with atopic dermatitis have upregulated phosphodiesterase 4, which leads to increased conversion of the cyclic AMP, and these low cyclic AMP levels then turn on transcription of inflammatory mediators. 
you look at the panel on the right side, it shows what happens if we are able to use a PDE4 inhibitor. In this case, this was illustrating crisoboral, which we'll talk about soon. And you can see that if you inhibit that PDE4, you again build up your cyclic AMP and turn off or decrease the production of these inflammatory mediators. Diagnosing atopic dermatitis is typically quite straightforward. The signs and symptoms are fairly classic in most patients and typically include reports of pruritus, along with physical findings of things like erythema, papules, plaques, xerosis, excoriations, erosions, and in many cases, lichenification, which is a thickening of the skin with increase in skin markings, and dispigmentation, especially seen in patients who have skin of color. You see an infant and the classic involvement of the face, extensor extremities, and note even the scalp is involved here. It was a common misnomer that if you had scalp involvement, that was always seborrheic dermatitis or cradle cap, but we now know that atopic dermatitis involves a scalp as well. The child is, let's say, a preschool age child, and here you see a flip over to the classic areas of involvement, which are more flexural instead of extensor. So you see antecubital fossa, popliteal fossa involvement. You also see involvement of the wrist folds and the ankle creases. And then as you become an adult, really anything goes. Again, you see antecubital and popliteal fossa involvement, and especially see dorsal hand, dorsal foot, ankle and wrist involvement as well, and often we'll see increasing amounts of lichenification. The photographs demonstrate some of these presentation patterns. The infantile atopic derm highlighting the involvement of the face. If you notice, both of those babies have sparing of their nose and the nasal labial regions. This has been termed the headlight sign and can be a useful finding when you have such diffuse facial involvement. The photograph shows an older child now with antecubital fossa involvement. You can see some lichenification and hyperpigmentation. And then the school-age child with secondarily infected atopic dermatitis. Notice the erosions and the marked amount of crusting that you see, which is usually indicative of staphylococcal superinfection. It's important to realize in kids with infection who have atopic dermatitis, you're looking for crusts and you're looking for pustules and erosions, but you may not see classic honey yellow colored crusting of impetigo. Various features in patients with skin of color, and notice most of these demonstrate the hyperpigmentation that can be seen, along with lichenification. And in that close-up of the foot and ankle, you can appreciate papulation. You often see more papular or follicular eczema in these patients. The two photographs on the far right show hypopigmentation on the bottom and depigmentation on the top. So either increase or loss of pigmentation can be seen as post-inflammatory findings in patients with atopic dermatitis who have skin of color. Well, atopic dermatitis is proposed to be the initial manifestation of the atopic march, which suggests that patients start off early in life with atopic dermatitis. They may develop food allergy fairly early and then later on develop asthma and other atopic manifestations such as allergic rhinoconjunctivitis. It's been suggested that aggressive therapy of atopic dermatitis early in life potentially may modify the onset or the severity of these other disorders later in life. This now summarizes the various comorbidities which can be seen in patients with atopic dermatitis. At the very top, we see ichthyosis vulgaris to remind us that you can have a variety of other skin findings and skin comorbidities, which are not eczema. Eye diseases on the right at the top, a variety of things can be seen in patients with atopic dermatitis, including periocular dermatitis and lichenification, keratoconus, and allergic conjunctivitis. More recently, there have been reports of associations with obesity, metabolic syndrome, and a predisposition to cardiovascular disease. In the upper left, attention deficit disorder is listed, and this has been found to be associated with atopic dermatitis, especially of greater severity, and may be most related to the sleep disruption that occurs in that setting. And then around the 8 o'clock position, you see depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation as a reminder that a variety of uh, psychologic comorbidities can be present. What about atopic dermatitis-associated infectious complications? We mentioned bacterial infections, so Staphylococcus aureus colonization is very common in these patients, probably related to the decreased production of antimicrobial peptides in the skin and decreased diversity of the cutaneous microbiome. 80 to 90% of these patients are carriers for Staph aureus. That doesn't mean they're necessarily infected, but they surely have an increased risk of becoming secondarily impetigenized. Viral infections are seen with increasing frequency in these patients, so they're at increased risk for eczema herpeticum, which is a secondary infection with the herpes simplex virus on skin that has a defective epidermal barrier like we see in atopic dermatitis. This can spread rapidly, can be associated with fever and toxicity, especially in younger patients, and needs to be treated with antiviral therapy. These patients are also at increased risk for mollusum contagiosum and a variety of fungal infections, including tinea. This shows essential features, important features, and associated features in patients with atopic derm. So you can see that essential features include itch and eczema to skin changes, typically with a morphology that is age-specific, as we discussed, and sparing of the groin and axillary regions. So in diapered infants, sparing of the diaper area is a sine qua non of atopic dermatitis. There's also a chronic or relapsing history. We see important features which add support to the diagnosis. These include an early age of onset, 
ATP either in the patient or in the family, and immunoglobulin E reactivity along with dry skin. And then associated features shown on the right can be suggestive of atopic dermatitis, but are less specific. These include atypical vascular skin responses like pallor on the face, other skin findings, keratosis pilaris, pityriasis alba, which are hypopigmented patches most typically on the face, hyperlinearity of the palms, and ichthyosis vulgaris, ocular and periorbital changes, other regional findings may be seen, and you may see perifollicular accentuation and lichenification. Once we've established a diagnosis of atopic dermatitis, it's important to assess the severity and the impact it has on the patient and the family. Severity is judged on the basis of several features, including the extent of involvement, the quality of the lesions, including the amount of erythema, the amount of lichenification, the persistence of disease, and the impact on the quality of life of the patient and his or her family. Persistence is defined by cycles of remission and relapse and is very common, and we have to always assess the impact of the disease, including the impact on sleep, interference with school, and or work performance for the patient or parents. While I said this was a straightforward diagnosis, there can be a differential diagnosis at times. Seborrheic dermatitis, keep in mind it's seborrheic dermatitis in younger patients that are more likely to be confused with atopic dermatitis. In infants, sebderm can look a lot like atopic derm, but it does seem to have a propensity for the scalp, the eyebrow regions, and notably involvement of the diaper area, which should be spared in atopic dermatitis. This is also true of infantile psoriasis. Contact dermatitis, you have to consider both allergic and irritant contact dermatitis. The photograph demonstrates contact dermatitis on the anterior chest and neck, in this case due to a metal-containing necklace that had nickel. Scabies is rarely going to be confused, especially by primary care physicians, with atopic dermatitis because it tends to be more popular with nodules and crusted papules on palms and soles and the genitals. However, sometimes when it's more extensive, it could be confused. The photograph shows psoriasis in an adult. This would be unlikely to be confused as the plaques tend to be thicker with that silvery micaceous scale, and more often you'd expect to see atopic dermatitis involving the other side, the antecubital region. And the theosis vulgaris looks like a mud pond that is drying and cracking. That's a marker for ATP for sure, but should it be confused with atopic dermatitis, there's no inflammation, this tends to be asymptomatic, and it will not respond the same way to the variety of treatments we're going to talk about. There are other things on the differential you can see in that box, and you can see more rare things to consider, such as cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, especially in adolescents and adults, HIV-associated dermatoses, and even autoimmune connective tissue diseases. So what findings in infants and young children should prompt the clinician to reconsider the diagnosis? Well, if you see severe atopic dermatitis, or what looks like it, with failure to thrive, with a history of multiple infections, either cutaneous or systemic, especially if there's unusual organisms, with an unusual morphology or distribution of the rash, or a poor response to treatment, you really want to think about evaluating this patient for other conditions, such as perhaps an associated nutritional deficiency or immunodeficiency. Well, let's move now into managing atopic dermatitis in children and adolescents. What are our goals of therapy? Well, we want to reduce symptoms, especially itch and the inflammatory skin disease. We want to prevent exacerbations as feasible, minimize risks from our therapy, and try to establish persistent disease control so that patients can be fully functional at school, at work, and at home. Now, this is really important because it is a stepwise approach to the management of atopic dermatitis based on severity. The start off under basic management, for every patient we want to discuss skin care, which for most of us, the recommendation is going to be daily short baths or showers, 10 minutes or less, warm water only, followed by a use of an emollient or barrier repair product. And then trigger avoidance where that's feasible. Sometimes that needs to be done in conjunction with an allergist. We always want to consider comorbidities as we've discussed. For acute treatment of mild disease, we use a low to medium potency corticosteroid. We use these typically twice daily, and we usually tell families to use them until the areas are smooth to touch, and maybe for several days beyond clearance to try to minimize rapid flares. We could consider a steroid-free option, such as a topical calcineurin inhibitor or crisoborol, which we'll talk about momentarily. Other things we might consider under mild skin disease, aside from basic management, might be antiseptic measures. So if these patients have a history of infection, we might talk about bleach baths. Moving into moderate flares, we're going to increase the strength of our corticosteroid to mid-strength, sometimes high strength, twice daily again. Again, consider those steroid-free options. And then for maintenance, it's going to be similar, except that for these patients who have moderate disease, for those who have hot zones, which are areas that flare really rapidly upon discontinuation of treatment, we now talk about maintenance anti-inflammatory therapy. And that can be done with corticosteroids used once or twice daily or sometimes just a few nights per week, or even maintenance use of a calcineurin inhibitor or crisoborol, that PDE4 inhibitor, in a similar fashion. Okay, let's move over to the severe column. These are patients that have severe disease where we're using medium to high potency steroids or steroid-free alternatives and they're not responding. This is when you might consider referral to an atopic dermatitis specialist or dermatologist if you are not one. And other things to consider here would be phototherapy, systemic immunosuppressants, 
and dupilumab, which we'll talk about more in a minute, the first biologic approved for treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. You also see other considerations, including wet wrap therapy, something we do for more moderate to severe disease, which patients can be taught to do at home and is very soothing and effective, or even short-term hospitalization if needed. Now, if patients are not responding to therapies, there are several things we should think about. Not adherence with our treatments, secondary infection that needs to be treated, perhaps our diagnosis was incorrect, and consider contact allergy, allergy to medications, or even just contact allergy to other products. This may require patch testing. Non-pharmacologic interventions include moisturizers and barrier repair products. Really, you want to have patients apply these soon after bathing while the skin is still moist after they've applied their topical medications. I always explain that locks in the medications and accentuates their penetration. It also locks in moisture. Bathing we talked about. Some patients like to add oils or emollients to bath water, which is not recommended based on the evidence-based data, at least. Cleansers, we want to try to use gentle cleansers or non-soap cleansers that are neutral or have a low pH and are fragrance-free. And we talked briefly about wet wrap treatments. Now, what about skin barrier impairment at birth and its ability to predict atopic diseases and whether we should be doing anything early in life to help towards prevention? So this study looked at skin barrier dysfunction and measured transepidermal water loss, or TOOL, at two days of life and two months of life and asked whether it could predict atopic dermatitis at one year of life. The study was performed in over 1,900 infants. They measured the TOOL at day two and at two and six months and then scored atopic dermatitis at six and 12 months and found that day two transepidermal water loss was highly predictive of atopic dermatitis at 12 months, as was the two-month transepidermal water loss. The same group did a study which also looked at skin barrier impairment at birth and whether it could predict food allergy at two years of age. So the same number of infants had their tool measured in the early newborn period and at two and six months of life. And at age two years now in this cohort, they had food sensitization testing and food allergy screening with skin prick tests and oral food challenges. They found food sensitivity in over 6% and food allergy in around 4.4% of patients. The most prevalent allergens were egg, followed by peanut, and cow's milk. And importantly, the day two transepidermal water loss was a significant predictor of food allergy at two years of age. So very important data here showing that early dysfunction of the epidermal barrier can actually predict atopic dermatitis and perhaps food allergy. This now takes us into groups that said, well, maybe we should be emolliating these high-risk neonates early in life and see if we can prevent HTP. So this shows a randomized controlled trial performed in the U.S. and the U.K. in 124 neonates who were at high risk for atopic dermatitis, and the parents were instructed to apply full-body emollient therapy at least once a day, starting within three weeks of birth. They found that daily emollient use significantly reduced the incidence of atopic dermatitis at six months compared to the no emollient group, and this corresponded to a relative risk reduction of 50%. This shows another study that looked at daily application of moisturizer during the first 32 weeks of life and its ability to reduce the risk of atopic dermatitis or eczema in infants. They looked at IgE antibody against egg white for allergic sensitization and found that while it was increased in patients who had eczema, there was no association they could demonstrate between early emolliation and these IgE levels. This being said, many practitioners now recommend early emollient therapy for babies who are born into families where they have a high risk of atopic dermatitis and other atopic disorders. Controlling itch is an important aspect to the treatment of atopic dermatitis. The American Academy of Dermatology in their most recent guidelines published in 2014 recommend against the general use of antihistamines for the management of atopic dermatitis because they state there's no sufficient evidence-based data to support their use. However, a recent study that looked at National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey data on physician visits found that they are still widely prescribed. And I will say that as a practitioner, I really believe in their use especially for correcting sleep disruption and trying to normalize the sleep cycle in infants and younger children with atopic dermatitis. But I also find that lower doses in the day can be helpful in some patients to take the edge off the paritis. Topical corticosteroids, they're still the mainstay of treatment of atopic dermatitis, and they're still very safe and effective when used appropriately. It's important to know that they are ranked by their potency from class one, super potent agents, to class seven, which are weak agents, low potency agents. Correct use of topical corticosteroids is considered extremely safe. Obviously, we want to be cautious about long-term use without breaks, and especially if we're using higher or super high-potency preparations or treating large body surface areas. However, if we follow these guidelines in general, they're going to be very well tolerated. Topical calcineurin inhibitors are non-steroid immunomodulating agents. They don't have any corticosteroid side effects when used topically, and they're approved by the FDA as tacrolimus ointment, approved for moderate to severe disease down to the age of two years, and pomecrolimus cream, approved for mild to moderate atopic dermatitis down to the age of two years. 
Now, these agents do contain a class Fox warning, which suggests a potential increased risk of cancers, especially lymphomas and skin cancer. This was based largely on animal studies during clinical trials and concerns related to the systemic counterparts to these drugs, things like systemic cyclosporin and FK506. Crisoboral was mentioned earlier. This is the FDA-approved topical PDE4 inhibitor, and it's approved for patients with mild to moderate atopic dermatitis two years of age and older. Looking at the pivotal trials here, you can see that we're looking at the primary endpoint, which included an investigator's global assessment score of either zero or one, which means clear or almost clear, and a two-grade improvement over the course of the study, which is a pretty strict definition. And you can see crisoboral performed favorably compared to vehicle in both of those trials. And when you look at the secondary endpoint, again, you see favorable performance with statistical significance. And crisoboral achieved success earlier than vehicle-treated patients. Treatment-related adverse events were infrequent and mild to moderate in severity. In in clinical practice thus far, the primary reported side effect has been application site burning or stinging. We talked about infection earlier. Important to recognize bacterial superinfection in the atopic patient. Again, you may not see honey yellow colored crusting, you often won't. You'll just see crusting, erosions, and pustules. It's important to treat these patients with systemic antibiotics. While topical antimicrobials like mupirocin can be effective for very localized infection, like the crusting you may see in the earlobe creases, if there's more widespread infection, it's best treated with a systemic antibiotic with activity against staph. If there's questions about resistant organisms or they're not responding to treatment, then skin swab and bacterial culture should be performed. The patients in the pictures show eczema herpeticum. This would be patients with rapid onset of very monomorphous, punched-out erosions or vesicles. This is HSV and is treated with systemic antiviral therapy. In young patients or in patients with any toxicity, they are usually admitted to the hospital for a few days for parenteral treatment. Bleach therapy or sodium hypochlorite treatment. This is a way to try to minimize use of antibiotics and minimize secondary infection. We're talking about dilute bleach baths, which typically are recommended as one quarter to one half cup of routine household bleach per a nearly full bathtub of water for a soak for 10 to 15 minutes, two to three times weekly. Now, there has been some controversy in the literature recently with some studies suggesting that bleach is no more effective than plain water baths. But for those of us who have been using bleach for many years, we firmly believe that it really is useful. There's high acceptability by patients. It's soothing. And I do believe we see less antibiotic use and less recurrent infection in those groups. This just summarizes the various phototherapy options. In younger children, we almost never use phototherapy. It's too challenging to use and to get access to. In older children and adolescents and adults, it can be used for those patients that are in the more severe category now and not responding to topical therapies. What about systemic treatment options for atopic dermatitis? I mentioned earlier systemic immunosuppressants. The most commonly used ones in the pediatric setting are methotrexate and cyclosporin. Other options, azathioprine and mycophenolate. Keep in mind that these drugs do have some risk profiles and potential side effects, and they all require regular laboratory monitoring. And then dupilumab, the first biologic agent approved for treatment of moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, approved for patients 18 years of age and older initially, and more recently approved for patients 12 to 17 years of age as well. This is a subcutaneous injection. It's an interleukin-4 receptor alpha antagonist. So again, remember, it blocks the activities of interleukin-4 and interleukin-13. It can be used with or without other therapies, does not require any baseline or routine laboratory testing. This was the pivotal trial for dupilumab in the adolescents age 12 to 17 years of age. These patients all had moderate to severe disease. They had been inadequately controlled on their other therapies and had to meet certain baseline requirements to qualify, including having IgA and easy scores that qualify them as moderate to severe disease, having a minimal pruritus score of 4 or greater, and a minimal body surface area involvement of 10%. The dosing was based on body weight. There are different dosing regimens based on whether the patient is over or under 60 kilograms. They were compared to placebo, and you can see that they were two arms of dupilumab, including treatment every four weeks and treatment every two weeks. Treatment was continued for 16 weeks. Then there was a three-month follow-up period and an open-label extension. You can see here are the patients in each of the treatment arms and their prior systemic therapies, including corticosteroids and most commonly cyclosporin and methotrexate. And here's the results of this study in adolescents. Looking at the left panel, investigators' global assessment score of zero or one, you can see that both dupilumab arms, the Q4-week treatment and the Q2-week treatment, were far statistically superior to placebo. And on the right, we're looking at the eczema area and severity index. That's the easy score. And the easy 75 means 75% improvement in the easy score. And you can see that based on this graph, nearly 50% of the patients in these trials achieved 75% improvement in their easy score. And again, this was statistically significant compared to placebo.
the peak paritis or peak itch numerical rating score was looked at and the drop from that peak score over the 16-week course of the study. You can see placebo in gray, dupilumab in both purple and blue, and the far superiority, which again was statistically significant in dropping the peak paritis score. And then assessments of quality of life, including the Children's Dermatology Life Quality Index on the left and the patient-oriented eczema measurement on the right. And again, you can see that dupilumab performs superiorly compared to placebo at all time points and out to 16 weeks of treatment. What about adverse events? It should be noted that adverse events that led to study drug discontinuation were exceedingly rare and occurred in only one patient. Note that skin infection occurred more commonly in the placebo group than it did in either of the dupilumab groups. And then conjunctivitis is highlighted because it occurred in 10.8 and 9.8% of patients in the two dupilumab groups. This turns out to be the most relevant side effect clinically in patients treated with dupilumab. It's unclear what the mechanism is. It appears to be inherent to patients with atopic dermatitis because in the studies of dupilumab for asthma, conjunctivitis was not seen. So how do you identify the pediatric atopic dermatitis patient who's a good candidate for systemic treatment? Well, they should have moderate to severe disease. They should have been adherent to their topical treatments with lack of significant improvement. There should be some impairment in quality of life, and it should be such that the patient and or caregiver are simply unable to continue with the current plan, given either limiting toxicities or the lack of efficacy. Written treatment plans are really important, much like we would give an action plan for the treatment of asthma. These can be incorporated into your electronic medical record and completed and personalized for each patient on how to use the appropriate medications, what to do as step-up or step-down treatment, and how to do maintenance therapy. Education of both patients and caregivers is therefore vital. And remember, we have to talk about using the correct amounts of medications. With moisturizer, it's not so important. They should be using it liberally. But with medications, it's important that patients are using sufficient amounts. Now, there are some quite detailed recommendations. For instance, the fingertip unit, which is the amount of ointment that covers the distal phalanx of an adult, and is about 0.5 grams of an ointment or cream. One fingertip unit is supposed to apply thin and even application of a topical ointment to the surface area equal equivalent to two adult hands. Most don't get into this level of detail, but if you look at the table on the right, there are also some guidelines for the amount of topical agents that should be prescribed and should be used based on severity of disease. This is for whole body application, so you would scale down from here. This is usually just a gestalt, and if a patient comes in and they've been on the same single tube of their topical steroid and they haven't been seen for six or eight months, you know that patient is not using sufficient medication. So that would be the first thing to address before you move on to other treatments. So in conclusion, atopic dermatitis can really impact the quality of life for patients, but also for entire families, and this should always be considered when we're approaching the patient and treatment recommendations. Education about the disease, the various treatment approaches available, maintenance of dry skin care and epidermal barrier function, and the use of written action plans will all help to increase adherence. It's vital that we address all steps in the pathophysiology of the disease, including skin inflammation, dry skin and barrier defects, itch, secondary infection, and sleep in every atopic dermatitis patient. Remember that increasing comorbidities are being recognized with atopic dermatitis and they should be addressed when relevant. We shouldn't be fearful of discussing these and we should be a resource for the patients and families and refer them appropriately when needed. And lastly, translational research is leading to the development of newer pathogenesis-based treatment options for atopic dermatitis. So we're really in an exciting era in the space of treatment for this disease. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash YGP860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi Genzyme and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.